What is it? Well, security culture briefly defined is the direct application of the right to privacy. That's really just it. I mean, people can kind of uh, agree or disagree as to whether there is such thing as the right to privacy, but the fact of the matter is that security culture is really applied privacy. Why, why is it important? Why should any, anyone give a damn? Well, people should give a damn about security culture because presumably many of them give a damn about privacy. There's been all sorts of advocates of privacy of one flavor or another. Sometimes they're so-called civil libertarians. Sometimes they are the free software uh, promoters and, and, and others. But the common revolving theme is, is that somehow privacy is, is a good thing. So yeah, if you care about privacy, you should also care about security culture because security culture is the very pragmatic implementation of, of, of the more abstract idea of privacy itself. So that's why it's important. It's actually doing privacy is what security culture is. What could be uh, poten uh, what could uh, pot potential ramifications be to those who don't uh, practice security culture? Well, a lot of things. One is that you could be sued uh, because you were foolish and said a lot of things, whether to certain people who snitched on you, or as a variant on that, you said things publicly that perhaps you shouldn't because it's very easy to misconstrue things, especially considering all sorts of vested special interests will seize on something you said publicly. Uh, and then try to use that as grounds for dragging you through the government's monopoly court system. Oh, geez, let's see, what are other possible consequences? Well, one Prison? consequence, <laughs> I was, yes, exactly, and I do mention that uh, throughout the uh, anthology that just got released, is uh, becoming a political prisoner because, uh, you know, you had pictures on fascist book or... You know, other similar things that I think is even covered in that uh, that archive I think you've got of those political prisoners. So there's lots of different consequences uh, that are already provable uh, when you don't take your uh, right to privacy seriously. Dual layer encryption, a proposal for sidestepping potential backdoors. And this is where Kyle's creativity came into play. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it came from uh, Gary, it was the idea from Gary Hunt, but uh, uh, I'll put it, Kyle put it on paper. So uh, I guess, first off, uh, for those who may not know what crypto anarchism is or uh, encryption, uh, what is encryption? I guess encryption could be uh, briefly defined in a very vernacular sense as essentially scrambling. Uh, you know, normal language, uh, scrambling it, or what the cryptologists would call uh, plain text, scrambling it into kind of this jumbled mess that you can't tell what it is, which would be your ciphertext, uh, you know, uh, at least in one sense, so that to prevent, uh, you know, hostile third parties from reading your messages that were originally intended only for some other, like, recipient who, of course, would have a way of decrypting uh, the encrypted message and so forth. So basically, encryption is essentially a way of making sure that messages from the sender to the recipient actually are communicated without third parties intercepting the communication and thus uh, twisting it to their own ends. Has it, has it, ever, been, has it, has it ever been tested, uh, the dual layer encryption that you, you kind of proposed? Um, I don't want to say too much about that for reasons of information security, other than what I will say here publicly is that I have asked in my article to, of the uh, American Cryptogram Association to do some security audits, I think was what I was implying, uh, so that they can test dual, the method of dual layer encryption and, and see if they can find like any single points of failure or just, just other problems with it. Um, so, has it been tested? Uh, not, in, not in the sense of like a security audit that's been made available publicly, um, but you have to keep in mind that dual layer encryption is essentially a blending of low-tech cryptography with high-tech uh, cryptographic software. 
So for example, if you're going to use something, I, and I don't recommend the specific classical cipher because it's actually really easy to break. But if, for example, if you were to take something like Clayfair and, you know, use graph paper and, you know, encrypt your message uh, that more traditional way, and then you were to simply, like, type it into, uh, like, you know, an email client that already was configured with PGP, and you could then send it to somebody who then, because of prior arrangements and so forth, they could essentially uh, <laughs> uh, decrypt it, both using PGP on their end, and then once they see the first layer decrypted, they can then, you know, copy it on their graph paper and, uh, and you know, use uh, and, and to kind of decrypt it by hand in that sense. So that's that that's that's kind of the idea. But um, as far as I'm aware of, no, there hasn't been any security audits and all or anything like that. And I've tried to get the wheels in motion, but it's probably going to take some time uh, to to try and figure out if there's uh, if it's going to be like 100% bulletproof or whatever. But as far as I'm aware of, no one else has actually tried to blend. And the value of dual encryption is blending low tech with high tech. I don't think anybody's even tried that before. Well, so well, social security numbers are the de facto national identification uh, scheme. That's what it is. So I know people a couple years back, or actually last decade, were really concerned about the limitation of like uh, a national ID card. But in all honesty, the social security number really is it. Like everything is centralized on their credit ratings, uh, you know, anything really. Uh, at some point has to go through that bottleneck of the SSN. Very, very true, very true. So, so when you, when you uh, get, when, if, you're, if you're above board, uh, like in my last job, uh, obviously Social Security is already taken out. I, I guess, it, it, is, am I owed my Social Security benefits? No, no you're not. And, and the case law that is in uh, my article on Social Security goes through this and probably the most important one was the Fleming versus Nestor case where there is no contract. Let me just say that because the listeners really need to understand this because there's this really bad misconception, inaccurate misconception that somehow if you pay into Social Security quote unquote uh, then that somehow means you're owed the Social Security checks really a welfare handout with like food stamps which is what it really is that you're owed this welfare handout once you reach the artificial retirement age of whatever the hell it is, but they keep raising the retirement age. Um, no, th there is no contract. So just say that to yourself. There is no contract, there is no contract, there is no contract, and the federal judges have said so repeatedly. There is no contract, you're not owed a penny from the Social Security Administration. Stop telling yourselves this incorrect idea legally that you are owed Social Security once you hit 65 or 67 or whatever the retirement age this week happens to be. Hey, Kyle. It's not true. Hey, Kyle, is there, is there a contract? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I've, I've had these... I've, I've seriously had these conversations, you know, uh, me being a recovery, a recovering conspiracy theorist. Uh, I still do enjoy uh, uh, some good doom porn every once in a while. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not as much, <laughs> I'm not like, uh, I don't know, they really don't have me sold. And it seems like um, I had a coworker and um, I kind of showed him some things, you know, like got him questioning, you know, just basically a lot of lies that are being told in the mainstream and you know six months later he's convincing me that you know this summer's the end and uh you know i kind of chuckle about it because i've been down that road i don't know how many times you know i'm i'm yeah hey this no seriously this year is is really the time it's gonna hit kyle you know it wasn't mm -hmm. last year it wasn't the year before or the year before that or however long you've been looking into this shit you know um but anyway, I, I, yeah, I, and the projected and the projected collision of Nibiru with Earth was supposed to happen last September twenty third, but I think we're all still here, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, How many we? times? 
<laughs> so. For the full episode and show notes, please visit vanupodcast.com forward slash 99.